Are you sick and tired of watching flexible people try and teach you how to stretch? This is a valid reason to get frustrated because when it comes to stretching, having flexible people show you positions you can't get into is gonna mean that stretching is not effective. Unlike weightlifting, where we're trying to achieve a desirable form to make sure the exercise is effective, when it comes to stretching, the position you get into is gonna change and depend on how flexible you are. And that is important to make sure it is effective and a powerful enough position to make you more flexible. An example of this is a popular stretch for rock climbers, that is the pancake fold. If you see someone doing a pancake fold sat on the floor and you're trying to replicate this, but you're sat then, you can barely move. If anything, you're falling backwards. Trying to replicate this stretch is not gonna help you. On this channel, whenever we do flexibility videos, even when we're showing regressions of an exercise, the main comment we get is they wanna see someone as inflexible doing the exercise. So I'm joined by Matt today, who is another coach at Lattice Training. Hey, I'm Matt. Uh, I've been climbing for 19 years and generally I'd consider myself to be quite inflexible. I'm quite good at drop knees and like, high feet, but anything hamstring based or open hip based, I'm pretty abysmal. So the first stretch we're going to go through is the pancake fold. And this is going to be important for hamstring flexibility and that open hip position. My coaching philosophy when it comes to teaching positions, especially in flexibility, is to teach concepts because if you understand the concepts, you can problem solve at any level. And I think that's particularly important with flexibility training because as you progress in your range of motion, the position changes and say so there's a spectrum. And so at each step in your journey, you're going to change it and make those decisions for yourself. So the first concept with a pancake exercise is gonna be called chasing the horizontal. And that refers to chasing a horizontal position with your chest level to the floor. So you said the basic starting position of a pancake is a standing pancake. And we're gonna always try and chase horizontal. So if I'm in my pancake position, I want my chest to be horizontal. And so as I fold in, this is the aim of the position is to go horizontal. If I'm not reaching that, I'm gonna to stick to this position. I'm still chasing horizontal. If I can get below horizontal, then I'm going to have to move the height of my hips. The reason we do that is to maintain the level of torque or the, the level of leverage at the hips. So if we take this rotation, for example, which we could use our strength in our wrists, as we rotate, when we get to this horizontal position, the force is being applied, the rotation or torque on my wrist is greatest. Once I go past that, I start to lose more torque. This movement here is relatively easy. The same, this is relatively easy. The greatest torque is applied when there's a horizontal position. We're trying to do exactly the same in the pancake so we get a decent amount of leverage, torque in the hip joint so the hamstrings can be stretched effectively. When I'm coaching my clients with the pancake, a general rule I will go for is I want you to be at least 45 degrees off horizontal to horizontal. That's the range you're working in. Of course, you're not gonna start at horizontal. That's your aim. You're always working to that. If you're already there, you're gonna try and make it harder. So at least 45 means you're in a good position with a good amount of leverage. And anywhere between there and that zero, that's a perfect range of motion to be working in to get an effective stretch for the pancake. Now we're gonna coach Matt through how to do a pancake, Matt being my inflexible climber. Now if Matt is more flexible than you already, don't be offended, these concepts should still work for you, you're just gonna to have to regress them a little bit. So we're gonna start with a standing pancake, it's the perfect place to start for most people. So first question I normally get is how wide do the feet go? I tend to just say do a five step distance. Now we do this when we're doing a horse stance, so I'll quickly demonstrate. We start with a turn out from together, so I go one, two, three, four, five. And this brings me into a five step width. This makes it kind of relative for everyone that does it. You can go wider and you can go narrower, but this just makes it repeatable for most people. One thing I'd say is you don't wanna feel like you've got a massive stretch in your adductors. You're not trying to do a side split with this. The fold is there to focus on your hamstring flexibility. When you get better and better at this, it will start to become a hip adductor stretch as well, or at least we can do that modification to it. But for the time being, you're not at your maximum width. And of course, if you have a flex mat, then you can keep your distance measurable every time. But if you don't, the five step stance works great. We're just gonna ask Matt to keep a flat back, keeping his core and lower back engaged and fold into it. And we're gonna see how deep Matt can go. 
So just off horizontal, so mat's pretty close. Like this is definitely an appropriate position to start training a pancake fold in. So we've found an appropriate position. He's very close horizontal and I would probably give Matt just a few weeks of good training to already break that position. So we need to think about how we can progress it moving forwards. Concept number two is use weight to assist you into a deeper stretch. Weight does not make it a maximum intensity, but it can help you get your maximum range of motion. So we've already talked about using leverage and position to get a good stretch. Now I'm gonna give Matt a relatively light weight for him because he's a strong climber, strong hamstrings, relatively strong. Um, so with this weight, I'm gonna ask him to hold it to his chest. You can put a bar on your back. You can do lots of different positions, but this is a simple one. Hold weight to the chest and fold forwards and see if we can get just a little bit deeper by using some assistance with a weight. I'd say getting much closer to horizontal in that position. So a little bit of assistance is getting him deeper you can come up from that position again. I would just quickly add a comment here. More weight is not always better. If you use the really heavy weight, this pick up becomes like a really hard isometric position and you're tensing to resist the stretch and then you're not gonna get a good stretch and it's gonna potentially cause a lot of DOMS or muscle soreness as well. So we just saw Matt go too horizontal when using a bit of assistance from some weight here. So we've reached a better range of motion with assistance. It's not maximum intensity. You can still hold that for a long time. But we know that we want to progress the depth, so how do we do that? And we need to think of a sliding spectrum between standing up and sat on the floor with your chest flat on the floor as well, the full pancake position. But now you can see Matt's hips are lower down. And this means that again, we're gonna to get to a position where we chase horizontal. If your shoulders can go below your hips with a flat back, you need to start lowering the hips. So you can see in that position, We've lowered the hips, we've made the progression harder, and so you're still chasing horizontal. And this can work all the way to being sat just on a book off the floor until you get really flat, and that's an excellent way to progress the pancake. One final concept before we move on to the next stretch, and this is the idea of tempo stretching. So if a position like the pancake, especially when it's elevated, it's not the most relaxing position, is it? It's not the kind of position you can get into and just focus on your breathing for 30 seconds. And there's a lot of value in that, but some positions just don't work really well for that. So here we're gonna talk about tempo stretching, which means you're gonna move in and out of it, just like you're lifting a weight. It's not gonna be a strength training exercise because it's a lightweight, but we're gonna move in with a slow tempo. So we think of this as the eccentric component, a pause, the concentric component, a pause. So we have four stages in every movement. And we're gonna count those. So I'm gonna ask Matt to count to two on the way down, pause for two, and count for two on the way up, and count for one at the top. So this gives us a two, 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 one tempo. So this is much slower than you would normally do if you were doing a bicep curl or a deadlift, a normal resistance strength exercise. The reason we use slow tempo, and it can get much slower than this, we can go to like a four three, for example, of a four second lower and a three second pause. Two reasons we do this. One is the slow movement in is gonna reduce the stretch reflex, which we get more with dynamic movements, which is where the muscle contracts to try and slow down the movement, slow down that stretch and help you rebound out. It's a super useful part of our physiology for when we wanna move dynamically and powerful, but we're trying to stretch a muscle here. So we wanna move slowly into it and reduce that effect. The second is the pause at the end. This is creating more time and attention in the stretch at a high intensity. If I ask you to hold for two or three seconds, you're more likely to go in there, give yourself a really deep stretch and then come back out. If I ask you to hold it for 30 seconds, you're probably gonna only hold a light stretch. And I feel that intensity in that stretch is a really key component to getting a good progression over your weeks and months of training. Tempo stretching is not the only way to do stretching. There's lots of other really effective methods as well, but this is a really good one to have in your toolbox for certain positions. There's another added benefit to tempo stretching, but we're gonna cover that in a later stretch at the end of this video. The next most popular stretch for climbers is going to be the frog pose. And it's obvious why this is really useful for climbers. It creates that open hip position, which is so useful for getting your weight into the wall and getting a better profile on your handholds. Aidan Roberts has made this one pretty popular because he talks about it when he talks about his vacuum style of climbing, being able to get underneath the holds. But this is probably one of the worst stretches for climbers that are inflexible. And this has to do again with leverage, but also friction on the floor. The reason I don't like this position when you're not close to the floor is 
a couple reasons. The first is it's relatively uncomfortable on your knees. If you want to relax here for a long time, which I think is necessary for a static position like this, it's not a comfortable position to be in. The second reason is the closer your knees are together, the more force we have going directly down into the floor and not coming out away from you. And to add to this, you'll have friction of whatever surface you're on. So exercise sliders, and these are the little pads which slide across the floor, kind of re remove this friction a little bit, but still not good enough in my eyes. Because what we want is the knee to be traveling this way for the hips to get lower. And there's friction on the floor, and unless you're really low, that friction is gonna to be too heavy to give you a decent intensity into the hip adductors and help you get lower. So we need to change this position completely to remove the friction. What we wanna do is replicate the frog position, but facing up. So if we're facing the floor, we call that the prone position. This is the supine position, so we call it the supine frog. And so what I want Matt to do is try and keep 90 degree angles, and I want your knees to drop apart, so it's this frog position and try and keep your feet behind your knees here. So you can walk your feet, shuffle them down the wall until you find you're in that frog position. So here we've removed the friction, but of course gravity is not giving us very much of a stretch. We want more leverage. If we go back to a concept we did previously, it would be adding weight. So I'm going to give Matt a dumbbell over here for that leg. If you can hold it on the knee and then this one over here and have some weight assisting you into the stretch. The adductor muscles here are relatively strong because we're putting the weight by the knee joint. The leverage is not that great. So five kilos is not a maximum intensity for you, is it? Feels okay? Good. I mean, I generally go up to about 10 kilos with this one at each knee and can hold that for 60 to 90 seconds at a time. Again, for three sets, for example. But those sets and reps can progress in your training, including the amount of weight, just like you would in a strength training program. I wanna introduce another concept here as well, which is the contract relax method. Um, and this is gonna be contracting in a passive range. So a contract relax in a passive stretch. And what Matt's gonna do is keep his hands kind of over the dumbbells here and then contract towards the dumbbells, bringing his knees up towards the sky. And we're gonna hold that contraction for five to 10 seconds. Again, this will change depending on how you feel works best for you and then relax again. The aim here is to, we can get an autogenic inhibition, which means that actually the contraction is gonna facilitate more range of motion. That's really good because it's gonna improve the stretch and the range of motion. And the second benefit is that we're gonna strengthen the adductors in the range of motion we want for climbing with relatively light contractions. Use weight to assist you to get the maximum range of motion, but not to achieve a maximum intensity. You'll find that in a stretch like this, you can keep adding more and more weight and the stretch will feel more intense. But when the range of motion stops increasing, you should stop increasing the weight. This stretch is a shoulder stretch and it is a stretch for the lats. And actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify a very traditional strength training exercise, which is the dumbbell lat pullover. So this is gonna be a stretch for the lats. And we're gonna look at one concept which is gonna make it more of a lat dominant stretch or more of a thoracic extension stretch. So building mobility through the rib cage. The small modification we're gonna to make to the dumbbell lap pullover is we're gonna do it on a bench perpendicular to how you'd normally use it. And this is so we can have our hips over one side and our shoulders over the other side. So I'm going to rest my shoulders on the bench. And now this is where we come to two variations. If I keep my pelvis posteriorly tilted and neutral and I go into a lap stretch, this is going to extend the lats and lengthen them from the point of the hips. And this is why it impacts your hip flexibility on the wall. So in variation one, I'm gonna keep my hips neutral. I'm gonna lower the weight as far as possible to bring the lats into a stretch. The variation from number two is I want to drop the hips down, not into an anterior pelvic tilt, but through my thoracic cage here. I want to lower this and get thoracic extension as well as moving the weight behind my head. And this brings us into a full extension of the upper body, which is super important for climbers that are looking to be powerful on the wall, which want to extend out and be explosive in that range of motion. We're gonna keep the hips neutral for this one. So lower the weight as far as you can go. Good, so hopefully feeling stretched through the lat. So the lat anatomy comes down here and connects into the lower back and then back up. 
So we're going to perform tempo stretches of this exercise. So I just want you to lower nice and slowly and then pause for two to three seconds at the bottom. Variation number two. I, now this one's a little bit harder to get because you need some awareness of your anterior posterior pelvic tilt. But this is my preferred method because we're going to get still a stretch in the lats because we're just going to offer the arms further and further until we find that stretch. But we're also going to bring the hips down this side. So if you imagine a back bridge position where you're bridging backwards, you're working on the flexibility through the front of the rib cage and through the thoracic spine. And again, like I said, this is actually a very important position which is probably neglected quite a lot in climbers. So Matt's going to bring the weight up above head. And as this comes down, I want Matt to drop his hips to this side of the bench. So we're getting this extension. The lats are still coming into a stretch, as you can see here. Now, I don't want the, the hips to tilt into an anterior pelvic tilt. They're going to remain relatively neutral. I want the, the flex coming from this part of Matt's spine here and bringing the weight back up. Nice. Matt's doing very slow reps to help demonstrate. You can hold just for two to three seconds at most. And then again, we'll just do a couple more reps. Nice. And try and bring the hips back to neutral each time. So bring the hips up and then back down. Perfect. One of the best benefits of tempo stretching is that you can perform sets and reps, count rest time, you can increase the weight, you can increase all of those different variables. And this means it's super easy for anyone that's got any experience with weightlifting to implement in their training. And it can be really motivating to count those sets and reps and build up some progressive overload over time in your training. And that keeps people motivated. And if you can be motivated to stretch, then you've got the golden ticket to getting more flexible. With this exercise in particular, we're looking at overhead flexibility. And for climbers, we want to be super strong in the range of motion we have, particularly in the shoulders. So when it comes to tempo stretching, we can also go for a lower range of motion, but gradually build up the weight and the intensity at a sub-maximal range of motion. That's where a tempo exercise like this for the lats becomes a super powerful way to get strong and flexible with just one exercise. One final concept which applies for all flexibility training, and it's the reason we make videos like this one, and that is you don't need to look like someone else when it comes to doing your flexibility training. If you see someone doing a pancake which goes flat on the floor, there's absolutely no issues with you doing a pancake which doesn't go flat. If you do a Cossack squat and you can't go as deep as someone like Aidan Roberts, that doesn't matter. You can still benefit from that position, from that stretch, if you feel the stretch in your adductors, if you feel the stretch in your hamstrings. So don't chase perfection, chase progress. And remember that if it feels like a good stretch, there's still benefit in doing it. Even if it doesn't look like someone else, that is way more flexible than you. Just a quick mention, we've started making some merch. So if you want to pick yourself up a hoodie or a t-shirt, go check out the link in the description below. That's the end of the video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.